Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Normandy Park United Church of Christ. And wherever you are on life's journey, you're most welcome uh, here um, in this Zoom worship space. Um, as we gather together on Zoom, I want us to take a moment to remember that our church is on the unceded land of the Duwamish peoples, the people that are still here. And uh, our homes, many of us, we live uh, where the Duwamish people uh, had lived and there's other tribes, so many tribes here um, in the, along the Salish Sea and the Cascade Foothills um, that folks that call this place home. So I just want us to remember and honor the land and the first peoples. Um, and I want us to remember too that the land is holy and deserves a day of rest. And we're gonna hear a little bit more of that, of that this morning because we are finishing up the third of three Sundays um, of talking about Sabbath and Sabbath keeping. So with that, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship and listen to this prelude. Please join me in the words of gathering. I will read the light print and please join Stacy in the dark print. This day is holy to our God. God commands us to rest one day of the week. Let this day be a holy expression of our love for God. And during the rest of the week, may we remember Jesus calling and do likewise. God sends us to proclaim release to the captives and recover of sight to the blind and justice to the oppressed. So that we might proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, a holy jubilee. This is the day our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And appropriately enough, we start off by singing together, This Is The Day. Yes. 
let us pray. Holy maker of stars and planets, holy one of Sabbath rest, we look for you in creation and in our worship time. Join us as we grapple with what a just Sabbath looks like and as we encounter your vision of Jubilee, help us to understand that when we rest, our holy imagination has room to grow and our ministries gain new life. God, help us to dream your dream. Help us to envision a world where there is good news for the poor, where there is enough for all. In your holy name we pray, amen. So as we've been doing the past few Sundays, um, I've invited our lay leaders to share with us um, some of their thoughts about the Sabbath and Sabbath keeping um, and different ideas of um, what Sabbath means to them. So today, Vicki and Stacy have kindly um, said yes to my, my request. So welcome both, and uh, we would love to hear from you. Sabbath means to me a special cup of coffee that I only brew on Sundays. It also means I get to see people that have known me through all aspects of my life, from early childhood, through a teenage years, to young adult, to middle adult, and now into old age. So it is a time that is special to me for that those relationships and those people that I have had the privilege of knowing. It's also a time of meditation where I kind of be quiet for a bit, think about the past week, think about the future week, kind of get myself in order for the week to come. And also is sometimes it's a special dinner that kind of honors where I have been and what I do. And so that is my Sabbath. Thoughts of Sabbath took me back to childhood, which so often feels sacred. Um, this was back in the time when dinosaurs roamed the earth with me and stores were completely shut down on Sundays. I wish every great faith tradition could have such a moment of stillness. These days we maybe get it on Christmas and it is special as if time stopped. And my dream and fantasy was that everyone was home with their families. So my family of four would go to church we would come home to the smell of roast beef or chicken, then spread out all of the newspaper, including the comets, have dinner at two o'clock, which was unprecedented. We were just together, no urgency, no chores. Then at eight o'clock, maybe seven o'clock, um, Bonanza came on and every Sunday we had stacks of toast that were cut into three parts. So you fought for the middle part because it had no crust. And it was buttered, so it made small lakes of butter in your hot chocolate as you dipped it while you watched Bonanza. So I thought, was that really sacred? Is that connected enough to God? And I realized in reflection this week, any time that we deeply savor our gifts, that we thank God immensely for them, and more importantly, try and help others have a situation when there's the smell of food in the house, you're surrounded by people that you love and you feel safe and that your worries are manageable enough that you can lose yourself in the comics. That feels holy to me. Thank you both. We really have appreciated all of the sharing that has happened these past three weeks. And I know it makes my Sabbath time more meaningful to hear from you. So thank you so much. Please join me now in the prayer of reconciliation. Creating God, sustaining God. You gave us your Sabbath law and your gift of jubilee. And yet we would rather be chained to the structures and limitations that entertain what it really means to set the captives free and make space for the earth to rest. It is easier to just be a consumer it is easier to just grumble on the sidelines. It is easier to look the other way and to not see what needs seen. 
Help us to keep the necessary time for rest so that the other six days of the week, we are prepared to follow Jesus, living out his law of higher love, proclaiming his good news. The words of assurance. The good news is we can begin again today, this Sabbath day. Every week we are offered the opportunity of rest and renewal. It is written into our sacred story. Thanks be to God. Our next hymn is I Am the Light of the World, and it was requested by Alice, and if anybody ever has hymn requests, please let me or Pastor Amy know. Uh, this one actually is perfectly appropriate for the time after Epiphany, where we hear Jesus calling to us that he is the light of the world and what it means to follow him in the days following Advent and Christmas. Please join me in singing. Thank you. 
sharing our sacred story, Leviticus 25, 1 through 22. The Lord said to Moses on Mount Sinai, speak to the Israelites and say to them, once you enter the land that I, have, I am giving you, the land must celebrate a Sabbath rest to the Lord. You will plant your fields for six years and prune your vineyards and gather your crops for six years. But in the seventh year, the land will have a special Sabbath rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. You must not plant your fields or prune your vineyards. You must not harvest the secondary growth of your produce or gather the grapes of your freely growing vines. It will be year of special rest for the land. Whatever the land produces during its Sabbath will be your food for you, for your male and female servants, and for your hired laborers and foreign guests who live with you, as well as for your livestock and for the wild animals in your land. All of the land's produce can be eaten. Count off seven weeks of years. That is seven times seven, so that the seven weeks of the years total 49 years. Then have the trumpet blown on the 10th day of the seventh month. Have the trumpet blown throughout your land on the day of reconciliation. You will make the 50th year holy, proclaiming freedom throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It will be a jubilee year for you. Each of you must return to your family property and to your extended family. The 50th year will be a jubilee year for you. Do not plant, do not harvest the secondary growth, and do not gather from the freely growing vines because it is a jubilee. It will be holy to you. You can eat only the produce directly out of the field. Each of you must return to your family property in this year of Jubilee. When you sell something to or buy something from your fellow citizen, you must not cheat each other. You will buy from your fellow citizens according to the number of years since the Jubilee. He will sell to you accordingly to the number of years left for the harvest. You will raise the, pr the price if there are, no, are more years or lower the price if there are less years because it is the number of harvests that are being sold to you. You must not cheat each other, but fear your God, because I am the Lord your God. You will observe my rules, and you will keep my regulations and do them, so that you can live securely on the land. The land will give its fruit so that you can eat your fill and live securely on it. Suppose you ask, what will we eat in the seventh year if we don't plant or gather our crops then? I will send my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will make enough produce for three years. You can plant again in the eighth year and eat food from the previous year's produce until the ninth year. Until its produce comes, you will eat the food from the previous year. And from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll gave it back to the synagogue assistant and sat down. 
every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, and my sermon title today is titled, A Just Sabbath. So please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we wrap up our Sabbath series today, I want you to think about one thing that you could do for yourself and God on your Sabbath day, something that you haven't done in a while or haven't tried before. Our intergenerational moments these past weeks have been designed to be an inspiration for allowing our Sabbath keeping to be more intentional. After this series is long over, I want you to think about your Sabbath day because it might not end up always being on a Sunday. It could be a Saturday or a Monday or another day. God gave us the Sabbath. And as our understanding of time shifts and our relationship with technology continues to evolve, we will need to continue our conversation with God as to what a Sabbath looks like for us personally and as a community of faith. In the book of Leviticus, we read about the Sabbath once more. Leviticus is a book of moral codes, instructions for priests, purity laws, and teachings on how to observe and celebrate holy days. Sabbath keeping, as you might expect, shows up in the section of the text that deals with rituals, high holy days, and festivals. Leviticus, you know, is a bit of an instruction book, and it has a reputation, especially in progressive circles. And sometimes we think this instruction book is a bit of a weird one uh, to our 21st century ears. But what we need to remember about the book of Leviticus is that at its core, it is a book about justice. God's justice. And with justice, God's love. Leviticus 19, 18, which is at the very center of the book, says, you must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord, your God. In the Africana Bible, a beautifully written biblical commentary from the perspective of African, uh, Africa and the African diaspora, Reverend Dr. Madeline McClenney Sadler quotes Dr. King, in reference to this verse uh, 19. Some of you will have heard this from Dr. King before. Agape, love, means nothing sentimental or basically affectionate. It means understanding, redeeming goodwill for all men and overflowing love, which seeks nothing in return. It is the love of God working in the lives of men. When we love on the agape level, we love men not because we like them, not because their attitudes and ways appeal to us, but because God loves them. Love must undergird our moral codes, our laws, our pursuit and understanding of justice. So let's jump back over to Leviticus 25 and look at the Sabbath again through the lens of love and justice. We need to note that chapter 25 starts off with the Sabbath being deeply connected to the land. God says, once you enter the land that I am giving you, the land must celebrate a Sabbath, a Sabbath rest to the Lord. From here, the details are laid out about six years of working the land and a seventh year of rest, whereby the land lies fallow and is allowed to regenerate. There's no tilling of fields or planting of seed. The Sabbath year extends to animals as well. The idea is that there would be bounty for all from these other six years of good work. And as if that were not all, God also instills the idea of a jubilee year, whereby every 50 years there is a grand time of reconciliation, where the captives are set free, debts are forgiven, people return to their land if they have been away. It is a holy year of freedom and justice. It would mean that once in each person's lifetime, the slate is wiped clean, there are opportunities to financially start over. Can you imagine being that person held captive and then one day the trumpet sounds and you are finally released, free? Can you imagine having your school loans, your mortgage, your car loan, your credit card debt just 
wiped away? We don't know if the year of Jubilee was ever fully celebrated as it is laid out in, here in Leviticus. There aren't any historical documents and comment that comment on this pattern of debt forgiveness and Jubilee of the Israelites or Jews, but that's okay because this notion of Jubilee is not something that comes from humankind. Rather, it is a notion that resides in the heart of the reign of God. This is God's ideal, not ours. God has covenanted with God's people and has a vision for what could be if people truly leaned into God's dream for humanity. It strikes me very plainly that God intended for the earth to rest, just as our indigenous siblings across the world have understood that everything has a season and that there is a time for rest for each plant and for each animal. Within the text of our sacred scriptures are blueprints for a different economy, an economy that blesses the earth instead of just taking from it all the time until there is nothing more to give. Certainly, we have not adhered to this wisdom and we can recognize that this wisdom is within our grasp at this juncture of climate crisis and climate change. It seems to me that a just Sabbath is one where the earth rests too. The earth would rest one day a week and one year of every seven and again during the Jubilee. And a year of Jubilee means that reconciliation and freedom are possible despite the constraints we humans have imposed upon each other to make God's dream an impossible dream. Jesus, one Sabbath, walked into the synagogue in Nazareth after having been baptized in the Jordan River, after having spent 40 days in the wilderness experiencing every temptation imaginable. He walked into the synagogue, the one that would, he would have worshiped in his whole life and picked up the Torah scrolls and began to read from Isaiah 61. What Jesus read in that scroll echoes the notion of jubilee, of forgiveness, of freedom. I will read it, the whole passage from Isaiah 61 that is cited in Luke 4. And it differs a little bit from the way Luke transcribed it as our friends in Bible study noticed on Friday night. So hear these words from Isaiah. The Lord God's spirit is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release for the captives and liberation for prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for Zion's mourners, to give them a crown in place of ashes, oil of joy in place of mourning, a mantle of praise in place of discouragement. They will be called oaks of righteousness, planted by the Lord to glorify himself. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore formerly deserted places. They will renew ruined cities, places deserted in generations past. What a rich text. Liberation that comes after a time of mourning. We lose that tenor in Luke, but it is right here. God comforts all who mourn. Those grieving receive a crown in place of ashes. There is joy in place of mourning, a mantle of praise given in place of discouragement. Jesus' ministry has begun, and these words foretell of the work that Jesus will do and has done for the sake of all creation. Jesus himself, one commentator remarked, embodies this idea of jubilee. Jesus is God's dream made flesh. So if you hear nothing else today, I want you to hear that. Jesus is God's dream made flesh. And it is Jesus who proclaims God's reign upon the earth. In these few lines, we see that what Luke is up to in crafting the story of who Jesus is. Jesus brings good news to the poor. Jesus proclaims release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus liberates the oppressed. Jesus proclaims jubilee. Jesus' ministry, Jesus' actions all speak to making God's dream a reality. 
Our role as followers of Jesus is to do likewise, to be a people of liberation and justice, love in action, not that sappy kind of love and a Hallmark card, but the kind of love that Dr. King talked about. We don't love people because we like them. We love them because God loves them and commands us to do likewise. Back in 1999, besides the fears of Y2K, there was an ecumenical and interfaith movement to proclaim a year of Jubilee in the year 2000. The idea was that all the poorest nations of the world should have their debts forgiven at the turn of the century by the World Bank and other big creditors. At that time, I was working at the East Bay Sanctuary Covenant in Berkeley, California with Salvadorian, Honduran, and other people caught in the snare of our uh, immigration system. One of the directors of the program, John, who I would deem a very good Methodist, would talk a lot about this idea of Jubilee with me on our walks at lunch to the coffee shop and back. It was the first time I had ever really considered the idea could nations really forgive other nations of their debt? What would it mean for the poorest countries to be able to start again with a clean slate? Has anyone truly imagined or can anyone truly imagine the impact of such deep care for the poorest among us? I'm not sure that I could. It's kind of a bigger than big idea. And as we know, this broad sweeping a way of debt did not come to pass. And the land of many of those poor nations like Honduras have continued to have issues um, like everywhere with deforestation, with hurricanes and landslides. Uh, they've been battered at every turn. And not to mention in Honduras, the corruption and the gang activity that leaves the regular Honduran people at wit's end and desperate for a life elsewhere often here in the United States of America, because the land has been laid bare, the land is tired and worn out, the poverty is extreme, and there is nowhere to go, nowhere else to go but north to escape death threats and food insecurity. And yet, even though a global jubilee did not occur, it doesn't mean that the idea has completely gone away. In fact, whenever we talk about loan forgiveness, we are invoking the spirit of Jubilee, believe it or not. How many of us know someone who is still paying off student loans? I sure know people, and they are friends of mine in their 40s, still paying off debt from 20 years ago. These are not even recent college graduates. As we know in our culture, student loans are just the first of many ways to go into debt. After all, we have credit card debt, we have car loans, we have the mortgage payment, and that is if, if someone can afford to take on that kind of debt with all the other debt that we have to pay because people can find themselves in the hospital and be buried under hospital bills and debts. People can not pay their uh, parking tickets or uh, have their tabs not be paid up and have a different kind of debt um, that they are uh, dodging all the time. It can just bury people. And for the poorest among us, it can often feel like there's no hope for they are convinced that there's no solution or way out from this debt that crushes. It's no wonder that people sometimes just want to sell everything and become a nomad for a while, or that some people just want to check out, escape, maybe overdose. The weight of debt is soul crushing and anything but life giving. This is why the pronouncement of Jubilee and Jesus reading of Isaiah 61 is so powerful. Both are a reminder to us all that we are not meant to live solely for work and the almighty dollar that goes towards paying off the almighty debts that we have incurred. If we are to be part of God's dream, we need to lean into God's idea of, of a Sabbath economy where love and justice are the foundation. 
Jesus did as much. Jesus interrupted the cycle by proclaiming the scripture had been fulfilled, that a new time had arrived where God's dream would be practiced and lived in real time, not some distant future time in the afterlife, but in the here and now. So even when we are living amongst unjust systems, there is a way forward. If we return to the wisdom of our sacred text and we begin by observing the Sabbath, is it really that simple? I think it might be that we just return to observing the Sabbath. So that means that one, we relish one day of rest, no matter what, where the pressures, you know, we just let go of those pressures to keep working. We let go of those pressures to keep spending, where we let go of that coveting of our neighbor's fancy new truck or electric vehicle. And two, that we live into the vision that Jesus shares from Isaiah of release, freedom, and forgiveness. I kind of have to believe that it is easier to have some spaciousness about justice when all are offered a time of rest. When there is one day a week when we recognize that everyone, the earth, the animals, all people are called to rest. We are more likely to humanize the situation and the people we are interacting with rather than dehumanize them. A well-rested people make better decisions. A well-rested people might just lean into the generosity and abundance that God offers us instead of the scarcity mentality, that me first mood of our current society. So friends, as you continue to think about your own Sabbath keeping practices, remember that God blesses your time of rest. You do not have to do more or be more or produce more or hustle more. In fact, it's just the opposite. We are in fact called to share the good news of the Sabbath with all who are sleep deprived. We are called to question our economic systems that bankrupt families. And we are encouraged to participate in the forgiveness of God and God's dream of Jubilee. May it be so. Amen and amen. In response, we sing together a pretty new hymn text, but a very old French carol, Build a Longer Table, Not a Higher Wall.
we now enter into that time of our worship service where we share our joys and our concerns. And so any announcements this morning? Um, Kevin, do you want to share who the preacher is going to be next week? <laughs> yes, I actually remembered I was going to do that. Uh, so our guest preacher next week is actually on the national staff for the United Church of Christ, and her name is the Reverend Elena Larson. And she is our national volunteer coordinator and oversees all of our young adult mission trips, uh, some of our overseas mission opportunities, and uh, all those who are volunteering for the General Synod, the National Convention for the UCC, among many other things. And I don't believe she'll be speaking on that, uh, but she is a very talented preacher and we'll be honored to have her next Sunday. And uh, a little bit of trivia as I went to seminary with Elena, so. <laughs> She's a California girl, and so I met her in Berkeley. Um, any other announcements? We have Enneagram. Our last Enneagram uh, DVD study is this Wednesday. So it's uh, number 12 of all of the DVDs that we've watched in the more than year that we've been doing this Enneagram study. So those of you that participated in that will be Wednesday, I think at 4 o'clock. It's either 4 or 4.30. Lynn can... Um, tell us exactly <laughs> time since I don't remember. Um, but yes, this coming Wednesday. And um, we uh, had Bibles and Brews for the first time in a long time. And there's going to be a vote happening about what should we study next. And so that will be going out. I might put it out to like more than just the people that have been showing up to Bibles and Brews all the time. Maybe we can just open that little poll to everyone and see what people might want to study in Bible study on Friday, Friday nights, um, twice a month, that is. Um, Shannon, it looks like you've raised a hand. There's three steps to get to there. I'm working on it. Good morning, all. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Uh, you know, you just mentioned the uh, Bibles and brews, and I just want to just, uh, just be, I'm so grateful that that happens. It's good for me. It's good for my mind. It's good for my uh, thinking abilities. It's good for my listening skills. It's good for uh, all of those things. And it also gives me a sense that there's, there's intelligent, wise people in the world and I wanna connect with them and, and, and learn from them. And uh, it's such an opportunity. And that text we call the Bible is full of opportunity. It's just all kinds of places we could dive in and find so much about ourselves and so much about the world and uh, still remain critical thinkers along the way. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Um, what else have we got going on here, folks? Um, Super Bowl of Caring is February 4th. That's the traditional time that we do 6th. I'm hearing 6th. <laughs> My dates are a little bit off today. It's the 6th, not the 4th, the 6th. For Sunday of February, so we're going to have a drop off um, drive around donation day like we've done during this pandemic. It's a communion Sunday, so we'll definitely be on Zoom. Um, so after worship, people will be invited to drop off for the area food bank and for, oh, you know, hospitality house, lots of lots of stuff. And that will more detailed information will be um, in the tow line and in our Friday food for thoughts thought. Um, also, I'm just trying to think what else is going on. Um, we had office closure this past week for a little while because we had a COVID situation in the office manager's uh, family, but all things are looking well and good. And so the office will be reopened as normal this coming week. So that is, that's um, another type of joy <laughs> that we have here at church. So if you called and someone didn't answer the phone, that's why um, we just roll with it. You know, this is the time of being uh, quite flexible and, and being able to pivot. And that being said, we are going to continue to look at it, how this Om Omicron variant is working. Is it, is, is it, are we, are we heading towards the, the downturn? And, and once that spike goes down enough, we'll be able to do um, hybrid worship again. So let's fingers crossed, pray lots that we can, uh, start with hybrid worship um, again in earlier in February. That would be a hope. Um, we will be meeting hybrid style for sure that last Sunday of February because we are going to have a new member join the church. 
And that is something very exciting. And Lorraine's here with us this morning. So Lorraine will be joining. And she's a palliative care chaplain. And so she'll also be joining us as a minister in four-way covenant um, as we will be holding her work as a chaplain um, as a congregation together. So that's something really exciting to look forward to as well. And more to follow on that as uh, Lorraine gets to meet the rest of you um, as time goes on. So I think that's what we've got for today. Unless anybody else has anything else they'd like to add. For time, talent, and treasure. Um, just know that you can always give online. We have a PayPal account and now we have a Zelle. Is it Zelle or Zelle account that you can also Zelle that you can also um, give that way. You can send checks in as usual. Um, if you still would like to pledge for this year and haven't yet pledged, you know, it's never too late. Just um, there's even a little line away on the computer where you can give your pledge and just say what your intent is on giving for the year. So that's still, I think, set up on our website for you. Um, Kevin has put uh, that link there in uh, the chat for you all. So friends, we share from what we have and from who we are as a sign of our desire to bring good news to the poor. May these gifts bring light to those in need and put the joy of the Lord in our hearts. And with that, we'll sing our offertory response. So friends, may you go in peace, may you go in love, may you envision and see God's dream around you. May you remember that Jesus himself embodies Jubilee. And we as followers of Christ are invited into the dream and the dance of Jubilee as well. Go in peace, go in love, amen. Our closing hymn is God Be With You, and we will sing together verses 1 through 3. God be with you till we meet again. Thy good counsel guide uphold you with the shepherd's care and Yeah.